On to our last three artworks in the AP curriculum. We've had a pretty good run. So, um, the first piece that we're going to be covering today is called Sunflower Seeds, um, or Quijuazi. Um, and the piece is by Ai Weiwei, who is an artist and activist that you may have heard of before. Um, he's been particularly active in the last 15, 20 years um, in the international art scene. He was actually recently um, over in Europe taking photos of and documenting the refugee crisis that is happening there. Um, this particular piece and a lot of his um, work that is happening around this time um, specifically concerns critiquing the Chinese government um, and Chinese society. So he is like Xu Bing in that he is using um, art, his artwork as a platform to uh, critique and subvert certain aspects of Chinese government and society. So he's been arrested several times, he's been censored and detained. Um, he disappeared actually for a couple months back in like 2010 or, or 2011 and nobody knew where he was and there was this massive like international outcry to release him and he was eventually released and he was like oh yeah they interrogated me and did all sorts of horrible things. So um, he's been kind of like constantly trying to evade the censorship of the Chinese government and because of that he um, has moved to a more international audience for a lot of his pieces um, including this piece Sunflower Seed which is in the Tate Turbine Hall. You might recognize this location from Shibboleth which is a piece that we covered last class. So this piece consists of over 100 million handcrafted, hand-painted porcelain sunflower seeds. So each of these seeds was handmade and hand-painted by an artisan in Jingdijin. So you might recall this name from when we covered the David vases a couple of units ago. Um, this province is recognized as a um, pretty popular um, and well-known location in China for having this um, long-standing tradition in um, porcelain. So this project took two years. Um, there's a great documentary called Never Sorry that was on Netflix um, that were, that kind of documents him actually going to Jingdijin and talking with a lot of the craftspeople that were involved in this project and then like the actual installation of this project. So it turns out like when you, when this installation was um, installed around 10 years ago, people could actually walk onto the sunflower seeds. People brought picnics, um, but it was throwing up so much toxic dust that they ended up having to put like a, um, like a containment unit around it so that people weren't going in and, and like like sitting on it. They also had a surplus of seeds made because people would just go in and like grab a handful of seeds and then walk out. It's something that's relatively easy to do. So um, sunflower seeds um, are significant um, in many ways for this project. So um, Ai Weiwei um, grew up in the aftermath of the Chinese Cultural Revolution where th when there was widespread famine. Um, his parents themselves were members of the more kind of like scholarly class. So he recalled that as a child, like even the poorest of his neighbors would share sunflower seeds um, with their community as kind of like a snack or a treat. Um, there's also a lot of propaganda from the um, from the era of like the mid nineteen of the like the, the mid nineteen hundreds that um, perpetuates this narrative of Chairman Mao as the sun, and the people of China as sunflowers that are turning and growing towards him. So sunflowers are these plants that, like as their name suggests, will grow towards the sun. So that imagery is used um, in some propaganda. There's also this narrative, this greater narrative of talking about the people of China as a whole. So there's this notion that each of these seeds is individual. It has its own story. They were not just pressed out of a machine. Um, there's a unique kind of care and love that goes into each one um, that gives it a sense of individuality. There's no two seeds that are exactly alike, just like people. 
but the precise arrangement of these seeds in these massive piles, like in this kind of like regimented space on the floor, um, creates this vastness and this sense of uniformity. And this is intended to critique the conformity and censorship that Ai Weiwei perceives has defined a lot of contemporary China. So, um, as I mentioned previously, a lot of Ai Weiwei's work has to do with critiquing the Chinese government as well as their handling um, of elements of their past. Um, so this piece right here called Dropping a Han Dynasty Urn, like he actually did take a Han Dynasty Urn and then destroyed it. So there's kind of like this iconoclastic um, element to this piece. And this was critiquing a lot of the, the destruction that happens during the Cultural Revolution when China was trying to forget elements of its past and then move on into a more like contemporary um, future that it was kind of divorced from its past. So there's kind of like references to the constructivist movement and that China was seeking to completely re redefine itself in a lot of ways. Um, this piece called Remembering, or She Lived Happily on This Earth for Seven Years, was constructed um, as a result of the um, earthquake in Chichuan in the late 2000s. So this earthquake had massive devastating impact. What had happened in China is that a lot of schools were like put up really quickly and they were really shoddily built. There was a lot of corruption in the government that basically made sure that these schools were built quickly and not very well. And when the earthquake happened, unfortunately, a lot of these buildings collapsed, trapping children and teachers inside. Um, China never did release a formal death toll um, for the Sichuan earthquake, um, probably because they wanted to cover their butts and not be accountable for like the fact that they had contributed to this death. But Ai Weiwei and his team of kind of like people, he has an entire like team of artists and activists that he works with both inside and outside of China ha actually went around to different parts of the Sichuan province and they went to every house and asked um, all the people like did you lose somebody in the Sichuan earthquake and they recorded the name of every child that they could document as well as how old they were. So the name of this piece derives from a quote that one of the parents said um, about the child that they had lost. They said she lived happily on this earth for seven years. So this piece right here is actually made out of backpacks. Um, and I believe it was displayed in either Germany or Switzerland, um, somewhere in relatively Northern Europe. So each of these backpacks is meant to represent one of those children that had been lost. And of course the message um, is written here in Mandarin. It's a really just incredibly heartbreaking and powerful piece. So again, there's a great documentary on Netflix um, that talks about Ai Weiwei and his studio and how he's constantly at odds with the Chinese government that kind of goes in and like just randomly destroys his studio one day. Um, how he like will kind of go about his daily life and then um, there will be people from the government constantly following him. So he carries around a digital camera to basically record all the stuff that he deals with. Um, it's definitely worth a watch. Um, it is at the same time like very entertaining because Ai Weiwei just is kind of like of the modality of like he just does not care um, about like the suppressive force of the Chinese government and is doing everything that he can to kind of like work in opposition against it. Um, but he also kind of has this aloof attitude that makes you kind of hate him. Um, he's a very interesting person, so it's definitely worth a watch if you're interested. We have two pieces of architecture in the Global Contemporary Unit. They are extremely contemporary, as you can probably see. So this is the Guggenheim M Museum in Bilbao, Spain. So this museum is actually intended as a project to revitalize Bilbao, which was this port city that was extremely industrial, um, involved in steelwork, and um, seafaring trade, um, but it experienced this economic slump in the 1980s after a recession. So this museum was intended to kind of like revitalize the area um, and 
kind of like allude to some elements of the area's past, but putting a contemporary spin on it. So there's actually a term called the Bill Bow effect that refers to the positive impact a museum can have on the local economy. So basically this museum was constructed and then all of a sudden, like it basically kind of like gentrified the neighborhood where um, it basically brought in all of these new businesses and increased the property values of everything around it. So you probably recognize the name Guggenheim. Um, there's the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, and this is one of several expansions of that museum that has happened worldwide. So this was built upon the museum's original vision of being something separate from historical precedents, something being contemporary and almost kind of constructivist in nature, where you're not kind of tied down by historical conventions. We're not creating these buildings that have like classical pediments and columns and kind of like all these things that were kind of referenced back to in neoclassicism and Baroque period and so on. Um, so this, when you look at the ground plan of this museum, you see no semblance of symmetry whatsoever. It's this kind of like centralized mass of buildings or of like these rooms that are stacked on top of one another and then this gallery that kind of juts out this way and then the entryway kind of juts out this way. You notice that the space that this building is constructed in is highly irregular. So one of the um, kind of hallmarks of the deconstructionism movement um, for which um, Frank Gehry was kind of like one of the founding members is this kind of like notion of not only separating yourself from historical precedent, um, at least in the sense that you're not creating buildings that look distinctly classical, <clears throat> but that you're creating a building to fit this irregular space. Um, what ends up happening, especially in like more dense urban areas um, and areas with lots of history to them, is that there's lots of historical buildings. We're gonna be covering a building in Rome um, so again, like there's been stuff that's been constructed there for 2000 plus years. So a lot of the areas that are kind of left um, in the more dense urban areas are highly irregular. So a lot of these buildings are kind of intended to fill out those areas in an aesthetically pleasing way. So deconstructionism is also concerned with this idea of creating this like fluid and dynamic and unstable environment um, where there's lots of these undulating masses. You're not seeing these like very like rectangular walls. You're not even seeing like perfect circles. When you look at the facade of this building, you're seeing these undulating lines that kind of look like waves. Um, this is a reference to perhaps the ocean um, and kind of like the more reflective nature of water um, as well. And this, the fact that there is steel um, that is used on the facade might also reference the fact that there was a steel mill in Bilbao. So this building has a pretty dramatic atrium entrance as you can see right here um, you can see based on the scale of the people that it's this like kind of like soaring interior with these floor to ceiling windows it's intended to be again this space where there's a little bit of an element of like things being stable you see a couple of these lines kind of like leading up leading the eye up kind of the same kind of trend that we see in um, cathedrals, these leading lines that lead us to look up into the heavens. Um, and the, instead of referring to art history, again, this building is referring to the history of the land that it's built on. So again, when you look at the um, ground plan of this building, it's highly irregular. A lot of this is only able to be achieved with um, more modern technology, AutoCAD, um, a lot of these softwares that are intended to deal with this um, kind of architecture and these kinds of irregularities in construction. <clears throat> All right, our final piece. Um, so this is the Maxi National Museum of 21st Century Arts. It's in Rome, Italy. Uh, um, Zeha Hadid um, is still active. He's an Iraqi artist that works out of the UK. He actually won an international comp um, competition to design this building, and the building took about 10 years to complete, so it's really a labor of love. So there's two museums inside of the 
Maxi National Museum of 21st Century Art. One is for like 2D and 3D art, and then one is for architecture. There's also a library, a cafeteria, an auditorium, as well as several reception areas. So um, this piece is also following the deconstructionist movement in that we have this highly irregular facade, um, this building that is intended to fit like a very strange um, kind of like space. Um, like we saw with the Guggenheim Bilbao Museum, there's lots of floor to ceiling windows and relatively blank walls. Um, a lot of the light regulation on the interior of the building is done by these kind of like retracting shutters and blinds. So the walls and stairways in this building are intended to meander and melt into one another, creating this dynamic sense of flow, um, which kind of works in contrast to the highly structured exterior. So the building has kind of just been described as this composition of overlapping tubes um, and kind of like racetracks and runways. Um, a lot of people have likened it to a subway system or other public transportation infrastructure, um, which is quite ironic considering that Rome in particular was in the Western world, kind of like a seat of um, transportation and the moving of people and resources across vast distances. So there's kind of like a reference to, again, like the historical context of Rome, um, but it's represented in a more abstract way. So this is the interior um, of, I believe, the atrium area of the um, Guggenheim Museum. Again, we have these kind of like meandering staircases creating these kind of like strange broken diagonals. Um, this contrast of this kind of like shiny black paint to the matte white of the walls. Um, there's not really like a symmetry to it, but at the same time, there's still a sense of balance. All right, that's it. Congratulations, you've made it through all 250 AP artworks.